think so. it's uh, Ultimate Fighting. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ultimate Fighting. Or you, WWE. Same thing. WWE. Same yeah, thing. The Rock. Oh, yeah. my God. So there you go. There you go. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for coming on. Wow. It's been here. a blast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of That Creative Life. I'm here with Matt Diavella, and I will just like to say, I knew you before you were YouTube famous. Wow. I'm YouTube famous now? You're YouTube that famous now. so quick. <laughs> it did. It did. It's so funny. I just looked up one day, and I was like, oh my gosh, Matt is all over my recommended feed. Yeah. This is amazing. See, it's not that hard. All you have to do is pay $25 <laughs> per subscriber. Perfect. Uh, and you just have Hit to have Hit the a, streets. Yeah, you just have to be really rich yes. before you, perfect, you get into it. Perfect, perfect. So. No, it's been so fun to like watch your journey. Um, and I think I... Did I initially connect with you, like with Craig? Was he the middle, or maybe you reached out to do a podcast? I or reached something? out to do a podcast. You know what happened is, uh, so it's very early on. Like, I didn't have any subscribers, and we were even talking about this just before this podcast. Is like when you're starting out, you know, just connecting with other creators, other people is is amazing. And uh, if you find somebody that you, you that aligns with your values that you think is really interesting, that also has a big audience that might be able to help promote your work or get like their audience to watch your stuff. Uh, I think that's what I was thinking. And I was just going through and looking for YouTubers that I thought were really creative and had cool channels. Uh, and yours was one of them. And I think it was a cold email I reached out to. Dang, did uh, I really respond to a cold email? You certainly did. You Back said, in the day when I checked email. Wow. I think I did. I don't know. You know what? Like the cold email game is tough. And I <laughs> I always feel like a like a jerk because I'm like, like well, you have to award-winning kind of, filmmaker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't do that, but you I'll be have like, to prove yourself. Exactly, right? you do. So like, if it's yeah. a subscriber count or it's, uh, hey, you know, direct uh, m- director of interview minimalism. with director of minimalism, yeah, yeah, yeah. Netflix documentary. I probably did something like that, yeah. and because uh, I remember, you yeah, because I think you had done a podcast with Craig Adams before or something around or, the same time. Yeah. yeah, so I think I had seen you. And then I was like, oh, director of minimalism. Mm-hmm. Holy smokes. That's like on my recommended Netflix all the time. Um, and I watched it but oh, before yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, before the podcast. And it's so good. And it's so cool um, to see someone who it's funny when you have a successful documentary on Netflix, you're almost like the mainstream. You know, you're like a mainstream filmmaker who has already achieved success. Basically, that's that's what I thought. And I'm like, oh, wow, I can learn a lot from him. So I'm excited to chat with you. Um, and so director of minimalism, um, you have a YouTube channel that's crushing it. How many subscribers are, are you at? Uh, we just broke around like 1.5, 1.6 million. Somebody. <laughs> oh my gosh. I know dude. It was, uh, I broke a million at the beginning of the year. So it's happening quick, but you know, you get to a certain point where it was 15,000 subscribers for me where I stopped caring. <laughs> I mean, kind of, <laughs> but like, cause I'm like, that's all I ever wanted. Yeah. yeah I thought, yeah. cause I thought 15,000. Interesting. That was time, your number. That was my number. And to me, that was like 100 billion. Like yeah. it was just infinite amount of people. Yeah. And I was like, if I could just get to that point, then it'll be great. And I think this is one of those things like I even talk about with minimalism and hedonic adaptation is that if you're not careful, the number will climb quickly. And you'll be like, well, 50,000. No, that's when I'm going to be happy. 100,000 subscribers. Exactly. Uh, so I've had that internal uh, struggle with myself. But yeah, yeah it's, been, it's grown very quickly. It's been cool. I've just been enjoying it. It's been fun. It's been really cool to watch. And it's so funny because John and me, my boyfriend, we have this joke where we get all of these like really cool YouTube friends and then all of a sudden they just like we just watch them pass us in subscribers <laughs> <laughs> and we're like oh that's <laughs> nice cool I hope they still text me oh that's hilarious so thanks for still being my friend I think it'd be it's so <laughs> weird though to me now, now that I've gotten to this point where it's so weird to me to think that somebody would change their personality based on how many subscribers <laughs> right. they have I think it's one of those things that I mean luckily being in the tech creativity space I mean it really really is a breath of fresh air. People in the space are awesome and epic. And, um, you know, most same people them. throw out most of them, no, they're, they're most they're of them. Um, but it's funny, like a few times that that's happened with more like mainstream YouTubers, it does. Cause you know, you just get uh, different groups of friends and all of a sudden, Oh, you're like allowed to hang out with this squad. And, um, it's, it's very interesting. Um, but what was the first video that popped off? Cause I know you had been posting your podcast. You had a steady, 
um, steady viewership. But what was that first video that was like, oh? Yeah, I don't know uh, if steady viewership is the right word. Like, how, like steady of 100 views <laughs> per video. But it was, you your know. Po your podcasts were doing okay, though. Decent. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the podcasts were doing okay. That was, like, all I uploaded at the time. Because I think the model I was basing it on was Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. Because I had watched his clips. I watched a bunch of his podcasts. I listened to Tim Ferriss's podcast. But I didn't know any YouTubers. And I didn't really have, know any kind of mold or the fact that you would create with this cadence where you're releasing a video once a week or twice a week. So I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, and I just knew that it takes so much work to edit like a short, concise video, even if it's like a uh, five to 10 minute video. I knew that that was going to be a whole lot of work, especially if this video wasn't going to get seen. And I was like, is it really worth my time at this point? I should just keep doing the podcast. If I keep cranking out podcasts, it'll eventually work. And then, you know, it got to a certain point, but like a couple hundred, I mean, I don't think I broke a thousand uh, much at all in the first year or so. And then I made a video called My Minimalist Apartment, and it was just an apartment tour video. I'd seen many of them. It wasn't like an original concept or idea. I'd seen other people do it. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I'll do like a minimalist apartment tour video. And I did it. It was three minutes long. It was very short, but I... I just made it how I wanted to. It was, I put my personality into it. I tried to be humorous and, and crack some jokes, not be so straight laced uh, and just add cinematography and, and really a high quality level to it. And that was the first video that within the first week it got 20,000 views and it just kept going up and up and up. And then I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. And then, but it was also just that light bulb moment where I was like, oh yeah, this is what I should be doing. Right. I should be editing short, concise videos. I should be really focused on storytelling. Are you still shooting with a red? No, but that's what I started with at yeah, that time. Because that was the shocking thing in the beginning. I was like, what? He yeah. is using a red camera for yeah. YouTube stuff. Yeah, it was, well, it wasn't by design. <laughs> what happened was, it was a big, big mistake. Uh, <laughs> See what happened was. Yeah, and my wife, Natalie, gives me crap for this all the time because she's like, well, whenever I'm thinking about buying a new piece of gear now, she's like, it's, this is not going to be like the red now, is it? <laughs> when you made that big $30,000 mistake. But I was doing freelance work. And for me, it was like always about stepping up my quality, always reinvesting. And I'd done pretty well doing freelance. And I got to the point where I thought it was, you know, the right investment to, to get a red to continually up the production value. So I got one. And it, you know, within four months, I became a YouTuber. <laughs> At which point, the red, I know that there's uh, lots of there's people. There's a lot of controversy right now yeah. with it, there's with the SSD and stuff. Have you seen that? No. People are basically taking apart the uh, proprietary red SSDs that you have to spend over $1,000 on and basically saying like, look, it's a normal $200 SSD with a red proprietary connection that, oh, look, it's like nothing special. Wild. So right now in like the tech camera sphere, a lot of people are making videos um, about it, which is interesting. That's super interesting. And that's actually pretty screwed up. <laughs> I know. I know. I don't know if I'm I mean, curse because <laughs> I'm, I'm editing myself live <laughs> and I think I'm doing a damn good job. <laughs> Heck yeah. But well, uh, I mean, red, yeah. it's an asset, though, especially with film, uh, freelance stuff. If you have a red camera, oh, you, yep. you stand apart. Right. Yeah. But uh, for YouTube videos, that that's not true. Right. right? For right. freelance stuff. And I think it's really only true for cinematographers, uh, DPs, because you normally can get a certain rate for that camera. Mm -hmm. It's like, OK, my hourly rate is seven hundred or a thousand dollars and my camera rate is four hundred to seven hundred dollars, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you can obviously charge a premium for having a red. Right. But I found that it just slowed me down so much when you're making a video every week. And I know other YouTubers can use red and shoot an 8K, but like for my workflow and what I want to create, it's just way too much. Mm -hmm. So I ended up selling it. And this was also at a time where I was a YouTuber for about a year maybe. And my, I like, I just wasn't, I didn't make any money because I mm -hmm. just took a long time to monetize in any way because I was taking my time, mm -hmm. but my run runway was dwindling down and down. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. selling the camera actually was nice to give me, right. it was like the only income I made that month. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, hey, I mean, at least you uh, sold it before uh, Linus Tech Tips made his big video on yeah. red. Um, but it's been it's just been interesting to see. Uh, poor Peter McKinnon just bought a red camera, too. But they're still did, amazing. Yeah. 
great cameras. Amazing but that is so great cameras. That but it's a, it's yeah. It's not only like a headache to operate, but I mean they're basically just kind of calling out their lackluster customer service and the expensive accessories that you have to buy. It's crazy. It's dude, crazy. I'm like, I bought a C200 and oh, that's kind of like plug and play. Like oh my god, yeah. Every, you just got a monitor. Yeah. A monitor costs like three thousand exactly. dollars for a red. And I'm like, exactly. what? I'm broke now. Exactly. So yeah, now that's people crazy. are final finally saying. Um, this, something's not right with this. Um, but so going back to the documentary minimalism, cause it's so funny how you kind of got your break on YouTube, uh, was hitting this trend. Cause I mean, minimalism on YouTube, a lot of people were making YouTube videos about it. And it's so funny that you like the timing of it. I feel like you were able to enter the space as like a very, like you had authority behind the subject, right? You had years of making a film about it and you yourself are a minimalist, you know? It's not like, oh, minimalistic uh, YouTube, you know, apartment tour. I'm just gonna throw this in the title because it's good for keywords. Uh, so bring me back to like, what made you make that documentary? Yeah, so- How did it start? Yeah, making minimalism, it was, it was a bucket list item for me and it was just make a documentary about something I care about. I, I, you know, I'm very into self-help. If you watch my YouTube channel, you know that like that's, I just really love it and I don't care how corny it gets. Like there's nothing like a Tony Robbins audio tape that just gets me fired up in yes. the morning. <laughs> I just get so we're, stoked. We're fellow Gary Vee fans. Yeah. So, yeah. so like, yeah, I, I mean, it's just, for me, it's just very easy to, um, to, to get excited about these kinds of things. So I put it on, on my bucket list and I was like, all right, I really want to do this. I need to make a documentary about something that I care about, something that's important to me. And I kind of, it, it just sat there on the list for about three, four months. And then I met Josh from The Minimalists. He's got a very popular blog. They've been writing on the blog since around 2010 or so. And I had followed them and they were one of the the guys that got me into minimalism to begin with reading their stuff. And so we had done one video together. I helped them out and shot something for them while they were in New York and I was living here and Josh called me one day. Totally like, forgot you lived here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's where I started the YouTube channel and the podcast and stuff. I lived in Hoboken for f four years and then we were in Brooklyn for two years. So it's actually good to be back here. It's really hot in New York, but yeah. I, I do miss it. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing place. But then Josh called me one day out of the blue and was like, Hey, do you want to make a documentary? And I was like, oh shit, like this might be it. This might be the time to do it because at that point I paid off a lot of my student loans. I was doing well with freelance work. I made up like a nice little nest egg to, to save up where I could take the risk. And so I just decided to do it and I joined them on the road for a few months. We just filmed all around the country. We had really not much of a plan about what we were gonna do, but we were all passionate about minimalism. I was passionate about filmmaking and I knew that we had a core audience of theirs, which, you know, I don't know how big it was at the time, but like it was big enough that we could probably make our money back. There'd be enough people that would buy the film. And so we like just put our heads down and worked on it. It ended up probably being about two to three years until we finally released it, finally got it on iTunes, Netflix and all that. But it was, uh, yeah, it was an uncertain journey for sure. So have you been a minimalist for like your entire life, the past 10 years, the past, you know, when maybe you started making the documentary, that's when you started take it, taking it seriously. Like when, when did that start? And what is your definition of minimalism? Yeah. Too? Definition of min minimalism is, that's a really good question. I think it's a lifestyle that helps you figure out what's truly important to your life. Um, because a lot of times we are told whether consciously or unconsciously, whether it's through advertising or a peer circle and friends that we need certain things in order to be happy. It's always, if you get this, then you'll be happy. And I, I still fall into that trap and we all do. It's like, oh, if I get this lens, then everything's going to be perfect. If I get this amount of subscribers, then I'll finally never have to worry about anything again. But as we all know, once we get to these mi milestones and these points in our lives, once we have everything we thought we wanted, uh, it can be a pretty empty feeling if we haven't focused on what's really important, like friends, relationships, and all that. So minimalism just allows me to, whether it's the things in my life or it's the clutter on my computer or it's the relationships I have in my life, it lets me question and ask whether something's uh, adding value or joy. It's something I want to keep in or something I want to let go of. And I first got into it, I graduated from college with $97,000 in student loan debt. And I did the smartest thing I could think of, which was to buy a brand new car. So I was about 110,000 in debt, 115. 
Because what's another few 10K, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, it's not a big deal. Just throw my tab. You know what's funny is that, uh, like, I never went to a guidance counselor in college, and I should have, because I ended up missing two or three credits, and I had to take summer class, and it cost $10,000. And the classes were basic algebra and weightlifting. <laughs> for $10,000. $10, yeah. So thank you, Temple University, for that. Shout out to Temple. Yeah. Wow. But no, it was a great education. Love it. Would definitely do it. <laughs> Recommend it for everybody. No, but uh, it was pretty It was pretty stressful. Uh, I, you know, having all that debt weighing over me, that's the reason why I had to move back in with my parents. But I also couldn't help but feel like a failure. And knowing that all oh, my friends were going out, they were getting their starting salaries, they were making money, they were out partying, and they had happy hours uh, three nights a week. And I was just at home, alone, not dating, not doing anything, just working on my business. And I was passionate and fulfilled by it, but I still felt like a complete failure. Because I felt like, I, like, if I got here, then I'll be happy. I thought I had to get all the house, the cars, the stuff in order to prove myself. And then I saw an interview with Tom Shadiak and Carson Daly. Tom Shadiak is like, he directed all these amazing comedies with Jim Carrey back in the day, uh, Bruce Almighty. Mm, and so good. he's so good. I mean, honestly, he's like, he's one of the best. So he, he was just talking about his story. And he's like, I had everything I thought I was supposed to have. I moved into this huge 10,000 square foot mansion. And I just felt empty. It's like, why, why did I want that? This is not making me happy. So he ended up getting rid of all of this stuff and moving into a trailer park in Malibu. And I'm like, that... That's where you move into a trailer park in Sure, Malibu. I mean, <laughs> it, it, is, it is in Malibu, so yeah. it's not like a trailer park in, like, back where I'm from in Jersey, where it's, like, a little bit uh, not so desirable <laughs> of a neighborhood is what I'll say. But, yeah, so he ended... But, I mean, that to me was just profound. The fact that somebody... Who has everything. Yeah, he wasn't, he, he gave it all up. I was like, I didn't know you could do that. Nobody ever told me that that was a thing you could do. I never saw that as a potential for my life. And so it just got the wheels turning a little bit. And it just opened up this idea of simplicity, of letting go of stuff, of not always trying to get more and more and more. And it really helped me going forward. And, you know, so not long after that, a couple of days later, I stumbled across The Minimalist and Joshua Becker and uh, Leo Babauta of zenhabits.net, all these amazing bloggers and authors that were talking about minimalism. So I just dove right in. I didn't have a lot of stuff to begin with. So I just pared down the stuff that I had, uh, you know, packed it up, threw away the garbage. I donated the rest to charity and gave some stuff away to friends, like some old guitars that I never used anymore. And from that point on, I started to like redefine what success was to me because success was always defined by these materialistic measures. But now I had this opportunity to define it in a way that was about uh, finding fulfilling work, finding companies to work with that, you know, represented my values that cared about the things that I cared about uh, and just surrounding myself with people that had similar values to myself. What did you study in college? Broadcast telecommunications. Okay. So you had been into video since what? High school or when did that oh, start? Oh man, did I ever tell you about the time I got sued? No. Yeah. So I got sued for $7 million. <laughs> what? You know what's so funny? This is probably the third time someone sitting on the couch in a podcast has told me a story about them getting sued. Really? And all of a sudden I'm terrified. Yeah. Is this a part of the journey? This is Am I <laughs> like... <laughs> that creative getting sued Yeah, life. yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> no, it's very, uh, it's very scary. And I think like that's... I'm because of that, I'm much more conservative mm -hmm. and thoughtful about certain deals and making sure I'm using licensed music and make sure the clips that I use. I mean, I'm, I'm an anxious wreck to begin with, but I try to be a little bit more cautious about the videos I put out yeah. uh, because I just don't want to be sued again. But I got sued in 2000, uh, what was it, 2008 or so? I was a couple years into college and I made a parody rap video as you do, as you do. Okay, yeah, because I feel like we talked about this when I was on your podcast. Yeah, we might have. Yeah, 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 but I, I might have hijacked the conversation with my uh, rap music video Oh career. my God, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, so yeah. I don't think it's we so ever funny. got we to your We have the memories of, of Goldfish here. This is actually, if we go back, it's the same exact podcast we already did. So um, what's, yeah, what's your experience yeah. so with it? So I'm not going to tell the long, long, long story, okay. but the main points are I got sued for $7 million for making a parody rap video about the produce department of the grocery store I worked at 
so this is like two years after YouTube started. YouTube started in 2006. So there were like these parody rap videos that were bu- very viral at the time. They were all, all over the place. And I was like, yeah. this is it. This is my shot. Uh, it's funny how now I'm a YouTuber when like I wanted to be a YouTuber like way back when. And so, you know, my brother and I put this video together and it was inappropriate. And we're talking about peeing on produce. <laughs> like, like, don't come up to us acting all rude because we won't be afraid to pee in your food. <laughs> oh. God. Really high brow. And then did you, so did you put the grocery store's name in the video? We didn't. Is, is that what the problem was? We or? didn't, but my brother had a hat on, but it was like SD, you know, you couldn't tell, but he had a, the hat on of the, the, logo. the logo of the grocery store. And somebody complained from our store because the video only got a thousand views yeah. at the time. And then somebody complained and then it went up to like HQ they found out about it and they decided instead of doing a cease and desist, they were going to sue us for $7 million. So like oh my gosh. the AMP, which is like the grocery chain that sued us, it was like they, they sued us for $7 million, me and my brother who had no money. Where did they get that number? I don't know. So it was, it was kind of tricky. When we first got sued, we thought it was a million dollars because that's what it said in, in like I guess the the legal document. But then once we got lawyers to represent us pro bono, they're like, actually there's three counts here and two of them are double or three of them are doubled or whatever. And it's like the number added up to $7 million total. If we were to get, if they threw the book at us completely, it was a long, like one year saga. We actually ended up being on national television. (laughs) Like we had 15 minutes of fame. We were on the front page of newspapers and we still have like a bunch of like the newspaper clippings. And I have like, yeah, me and my brother. So how did you find someone pro bono for? Oh, we lucked out. Pat Farmer is the name of the lawyer. So Pat's watching. Shout out to Pat. What's up, Pat? Their, uh, their whole law firm. Like it was just the nicest people. and, And Pat was just there with us. And, we were just dumb kids that are like rebellious and like, no, let's fight the man. Yeah. Like, let's, like, let's go to court. <laughs> Not knowing what that would mean to, for our lives and how serious it was. And he's like, okay, if that's what you want to do, like we're willing to do whatever you guys want to do. Wow. And, uh, but we ended up settling and we ended up, you know, removing the video from the internet, though it can be found, <laughs> unfortunately. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> we could cut that. Please. Um, Oh my gosh. So did that, when, when was that? Like in, in your life? That was high school? 2008. So I was two, no, two years into college. Okay. But I would say like that was the first time I ever got serious attention for a video. And like, I was like, on the flip side, oh, this is interesting. Yeah. (laughs) And it, and it paved the way for me to, to, I think pursue filmmaking seriously. Like I just always loved it. It was the only thing I was really into. The only thing I was good at. Um, well, growing up in Jersey, was it your outlet? I mean, did your did a friend do it? Like, where where did you first find it? Uh, I started. Uh, shout out to Mr. Brant in Voorhees High School. So, a mate, he was the TV communications, the head of all that stuff, and all the the classes and the film and TV studio stuff in our school. So, I took every TV editing and production class in school, and like we had pretty really good equipment for the time. We had Mac pros we had uh yeah we had a a tv station that transmitted to like every classroom in the school and so i just loved it and i would go in during lunch i would go in during study hall hours any available time i had and i would just pour myself into these videos and i wasn't sure i could actually make a living doing it and a lot of people told me that it probably wasn't possible that there wasn't a lot of jobs that you'd have to go through hollywood and like the industry like dslrs weren't a thing at the time my first camera was a Sony Handycam, and it was just nice. tape, uh, and the quality was horrible. Mm-hmm. So I just made them for me at the time, and I made it because I really liked it. And then, you know, it took about ten years to, I mean, m- maybe a little bit less, but around there to like actually have some it's success. It's a process, in it. right? It sure is. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, the you know, starting the documentary, uh, it sounds like it didn't start with a structure. It was kind of like, okay, you guys are going on tour talking about minimalism. That's obviously going to be what the documentary is about. But what was that process like once you got back from tour? Did you say, oh, okay, let's set up interviews. Was that the next step or was the next step? Okay, how are we going to add X, Y, Z? Um, you know, cause I, I always, the documentaries that I love, uh, it always revolves around like either one person, two people, maybe a central family. Uh, There's always like a center idea, right? And then everything like aids that. There's a, 
maybe we can like geek out about this because I love documentaries and it's like my fave thing ever. Um, but something that I've noticed with some of these new Netflix documentaries is it never like lands on a person. Um, I just watched this. Uh, it's called Creative Minds. Have you seen that? Or I forgot. Man. Yeah, I started it. Okay. <laughs> I didn't finish okay. it. Okay. Okay. Good though. <laughs> Good. I, know, I feel bad. I don't like. I, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to. This isn't about bashing anyone. Everyone has a preference. But it was so weird because everyone started like recommending it to me. Sarah, you have to watch this because, you know, I do docuseries stuff. I was like, sick. And I started watching it, but it just kept bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. And it never landed on anything. And it was like a new interviewee and like, a, you know, and it never really, it never grabbed me. Yeah. Um, and that's I know I'm going off on a tangent. But no, but that's the thing. That's the, d- the difficult thing about talking head documentaries. And that's yeah. what I, I did do one like that, that was called design disruptors. And it was interviewing people in tech and Silicon Valley, uh, like from Facebook and Airbnb, Twitter about how they design their apps and how they how, create the user experience to be seamless. That sounds interesting. Yeah, but it's like it's a very challenging documentary to put together because you have fr- 80 interviews over 30 companies, and it's like, how do you create a cohesive voice? And um, you know, could have certainly done a lot better. There are people that are amazing at it, that are brilliant at putting these stories together. What and do you think the secret sauce is for the Talking Head stuff? You need characters that are really interesting. The people need to be interesting. Uh, oh, well, the one thing I found is that. You could create emotion or you can capture emotion. You could certainly create emotion in a film by stitching together all this amazing footage of soldiers coming home from war and grabbing their puppies and you have a country music song in the background uh, and like you can have this big triumphant build up with B-roll and like that's one thing but like just a simple raw clip of an emotional person like detailing a story of something that they overcame is just as good as all that flashy editing. I think it's better. I think that's what you're trying to do as a filmmaker is just you have capture. to have, there has to be time in order for the person watching to be able to like, oh, I feel invested in this person. Yeah, so right? I think that's obviously a part of the deal too is like you have to, you know, build that character up a little bit. And I think a lot of times you, it's a continuous process. You have to kind of find it in the edit as you're shooting. So I do think it's not go out, shoot every single thing that you think you're ever going to need for this film and edit it together. I think that's something that we can do for short videos uh, or short documentaries. But when you're doing a full hour, if you're trying to pull somebody along for that full thing, I think it's helpful to like, you shoot an interview or you, you, you follow this person around for a little bit. You, you maybe give it to an editor or you yourself work through it and find where the story could go. And I think that's what we did with minimalism. It was just a continuous process of interviewing, pulling things together. We found the through line to be Josh and Ryan's story, like going across the country. I think that kind of happened as we were going around the country. We're like, oh, this could be interesting. Like as you guys build momentum and build a bigger audience and start to do bigger venues, that could be how we uh, stitch together your story in the film. And that's, I mean, what you said, there always has to be a line. There always has to be, I feel like, a central thing theme of either progression or regression whatever you're trying to convey in the story but there has to be movement the story Not has to go somewhere yeah exactly and i think that's the biggest differentiator of people who can actually storytell is i feel like in the sense storytelling is like <laughs> this character this whatever is in point a and now they are in point b and so I think documentaries can be stale when there's no people can't see a journey. Yeah. And one other like small detail piece of advice I got from the editor of Helvetica. I don't know if you ever saw that. I love that. documentary. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's great. I mean, that's an amazing example of a boring topic. Let's let's put it out there. That's a boring topic. It's a font, a documentary about a font, but it's amazing. It's really well done. It's so artfully, like, if I'm you... I'm a sucker for documentaries like yeah, that, Yeah, and if you yeah. watch that from the perspective of, like, how they edit it together, it so seamlessly connects from each point to the next, and you're like, that's just phenomenal. So I reached out to her, along with my producer for Design Disruptors, that documentary I just mentioned, uh, to get some advice about the rough cut we were working on, and we also... And then I decided, like, I really loved her advice on that, so I sent her Minimalism, which I was working on as well. And she's like, the one thing I would suggest is don't say the same thing twice. You should never say the same thing twice in a documentary or a video. Sometimes it's hard when we're making YouTube videos because we're like, 
you know, we're trying to add some meat to the con, the meat to the video, and we want to make an eight to ten minute video. So if we're rambling on a little bit, we can often redo it. But a lot of times, I just try to follow through with that, especially with a longer form project. If you've introduced a piece of information about a character, you shouldn't have to say it again. And when you say two, three times in a row, like people are smart. They will remember that you have a brother and his name is Mark. You know, I literally just we were talking about like hiring people and writing stuff down. I literally just wrote that down in my little Google Doc thing, uh, you know, for advice for editors who help me, um, because with tech stuff there's a lot of information you're going through and a lot of times you're just blah blah blah, blah and oh it's 15 inch screen blah, blah blah 15 inch screen and even if that happens a few times in the video it significantly slows it down um and it has so much to do with pacing I, I think that's such a good practical tip even not just documentaries but any video that you're making like if there's any redundancy at all, it has to have a specific storytelling goal. Yeah. You know, and I think it comes through with planning. I think yeah. you can, you see the final video, but you don't see the hundred or a thousand steps that went into making it. And for me, like it really all starts with a lot of writing and just getting everything I could think out of my head onto the page. Cause like if I cover a topic, I really want to do it justice and I want to make sure that I'm, telling the story in the right way and I'm like I'm not the greatest off the cuff and I know that if I just plan this video out and if I cut out the redundancies if I go into the areas where I think will will help people the most that's usually the best way to go about it (laughs) like if you look at uh, and I'm sure you've done this in the past too like some of the early videos of mine are just me trying to riff on camera (laughs) I I still do the riffing I know (laughs) I know and it's are you good at riffing uh, with, so, yeah, because I was going to make a point with you, uh, you know, the fact that you write out all your stuff. So I'm still in the zone where if it's a very technical thing and I want to make sure I hit all the tech points, I'll write it out. But outside of that, um, I do still riff a ton. But I'm actually rethinking all of that because now that I want to offload some of the editing, it's very hard, me as an editor, if I have the step one through step Z, I'll be able to make it fine, right? Because I know exactly what I want in my head. But when someone else is watching and in your brain, your process is like, oh, I'll fix it in the edit. They don't know what you want to do. So now I'm kind of like backpedaling and rethinking my shooting process. I need to write more things out. Um, If it's more of a natural like vloggy style, then that's fine. Um, But yeah, I'm very used to just kind of like the riffing. And but a lot of times that's when you end up with a 40 minute clip that you have to cut down to 10 minutes. And you're like, what? Yeah, I plan spontaneity into my videos. That's good. So I plan like, you know, I have a structure of where the video is going to go. I do a lot of voiceovers because I don't love being on camera. I don't love, I know like you were talking about like, you don't, you don't love vlogging. Like the vlogging thing is, is, is challenging in its own right. And I do a little bit of that, but like, I mean, it's not like I hate being on camera. I just love filmmaking and editing. Like I just love that part. I had to be on camera because I, I didn't have any friends. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're in a very similar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wait, it's like nobody I, wants to help me with videos. Yeah. I guess I'll be in the video. Yeah. But I mean, it, it's the easiest thing. Exactly. And it's YouTube. So it's a lot of do it yourself. And yeah, I, I love editing. I edited before I filmed anything. So I went into it backwards where I was like 20 years old and just got my first camera, like the Canon 70D, because I was so used to borrowing other footage and just being the editor for projects. So, um, but yeah, I still, I still love editing. Yeah. I think it's like, you have to focus on the things that you really love to do. Like, what do you really enjoy? And sometimes we think that we have to do everything or, uh, and there's, there's something to be said about especially in the beginning, doing it all and like getting experience in every part of production. But then I think we, and and like, there's always going to be challenges. You're never going to get past that. But if you really don't love being on camera or it's just something you want to diminish or or, or reduce, there's other ways to tell a story. And like, and you could partner up with someone and they could be the on-camera talent and you produce and edit. Or you do more interviews. Yeah. Yeah. You can lighten it up in that way. Like, I love Mango Street. Mm -hmm. They're great because they're introverts, but they, they 
use that to their advantage in their storytelling. Like that's how they tell their stories right. is by using more voiceovers, by being more thoughtful about how they put their edits together and do their tutorials. So I think it's like you have to make your videos in your own way, your own style. Right. So you've done something that a lot of people strive to do, you know, build that uh, audience who's behind you 100% and they take that extra step to pledge as, as a patron, right? And so you've had a really successful patron and now as you're, you're building, you're also working brands into your YouTube stuff. Um, but initially you were just Patreon driven. So how many people have pledged to your... 2000 2000 which mm -hmm. is crazy yeah it's awesome. i mean it's so nice yeah it's, people are so nice it's so great <laughs> you know what people Thanks, are so guys. nice in the youtube comments are you people nice to you <laughs> um i mean most people it depends yeah. it depends if the video pops off in an mm, area of exactly. youtube that's bad yes, yes. then that's when the if bad comments off, start. period if it gets too popular <laughs> yeah. you never look at the comments exactly. section exactly if it breaks like a million you're like ah no forget <laughs> yeah. it it's dead <laughs> burn my, it down my burn it down <laughs> <laughs> abort yeah my main audience is so nice and like creative beautiful humans but if anything pops off i just don't open the youtube app isn't that all. sad? <laughs> like, but yeah. I mean, it's fine. It's part of the it's part of the territory. Yeah. Because people don't. That's what I think is great about building an audience over time versus just going viral or having one moment to find your entire career is because people get to know you and they they understand that you're human and you make mistakes or you may uh, you may not make the best video in the world, but they're always there. They're there like through the ups and the downs. Yeah. So where, how did it start, the Patreon? Was it one tier? Was it three tiers? What, what do you offer to people that makes them go over to your page? Because a lot of people see that as, okay, I don't need millions of people. If I could maybe just get 100 Patreons, I could do this as a side hustle. You know, yeah. I, this could be a thing. So, I mean, how, yeah, what your first 100 Patreons, what were your tiers and how, how has it evolved? It hasn't changed a whole lot okay. although the only th difference is so i'd say when i first started out i had three tiers and i kind of when i launched it i was very thoughtful about it and i wanted to make it into kind of like a big release and i really lucked out because that's right around the time when my audience grew substantially so it was right before it and that's how i was able to grow it so quickly because my audience grew at the same time and i was constantly getting new people coming in but I had three tiers. The first tier was help support my videos and, and keep them ad free. And the only thing I've changed about that tier is that I just, I, my videos aren't ad free anymore. So I just help support my videos. So <laughs> just give me money and you don't get Welcome. anything in return. Welcome to the dark side, man. Yeah. They, Taking you, corporate money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. It feels good. It feels good. I love it. Sponsors are great. Is this video sponsored? It's, <laughs> no, probably not. Probably not. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Shout out to Aud no. Audible. No, Audible probably doesn't sponsor podcasts because they want you to listen to an audiobook, right? That's a great point. But they, I think they might have podcasts on there. Okay. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I should know because they're, they're, first. The first, <laughs> yeah. they're the first one that's sponsored me. So they're cool. I love Shout Audible. Out to Audible. <laughs> yeah. They sponsored one of my videos and then they never came back. So I guess I... Really? I guess yeah, I'll I, see how that works out for me. <laughs> Because usually I'm I'm pretty good about like repeat, you know, people yeah. like Squarespace it's and yeah, um, and that was like the one that didn't come back, and I feel very hurt. Audible, yeah. I love you guys, come back. Yeah, I put I love Audible too, and I'll definitely if I talk to him, which I haven't yet, <laughs> I'll put in a good word. Thanks, thanks. But uh, I no, it's dude. Honestly, I put a lot of pressure on myself with that whole advertising thing too. Like it was, I thought about it for a long, long time. And like, is this contradictory? Is this against like my message? Because I do, I do think that a large portion of advertising can be very negative and it can drive us to make decisions that are against uh, our best interest. But there are people out there like Tim Ferriss and others like you that work with brands that add value to your life that you love or you make exciting and interesting content with. And I think that there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And I think that like a lot of people, they're not just open about the sponsorships they do too. They're not declaring whether they're doing a sponsorship or not. So I think it's... There's a there's a good way to do it. And especially yeah. when you have influence, you, you're you at a position where you can say yes or no. You know, you can choose who you want to work with. And I think it's important um, in the beginning too, because 
it's I think people appreciate that it's something that you know you put a lot of thought into and you're not just accepting everything that's in your inbox you know I mean I think uh yeah I mean like my guidelines in the beginning was just like uh I won't do alcohol brands and I won't do soda Mm -hmm. I think even though I can enjoy a mean margarita every now and then Sure. sure right um I just like that's it's not the best right that's that's my line um and, and I, then i yeah, think exactly. with ev- totally but it's mine yeah. right and it's like that doesn't mean that someone doing a beer brand deal is evil um it's like it's you can have your own standards right? uh, yeah we shouldn't i don't think we should like judge people i think there are lines that some people step over i was just talking to jordan syatt who uh he was gary v's personal trainer and he's got an awesome youtube channel but he was talking about how uh, I think the Kardashians or something had a T or something. There was something that went viral like that. Like there are examples where it's unethical, where you're maybe pushing a product that's that literally like, oh, this will make you skinny, yeah. but really it just makes you have I diarrhea. Don't like that. Yeah, but I, don't, I, but I still don't think I'm. I'm not going to judge them and uh, as people. I just think it was a well, the market terrible will decision. decide. And, the market's going to decide. And <laughs> they decided that it was awful. Right? Exactly. So yeah. I, and and there are people that promote iPhone or what androids from iPhones yeah. right? I, I, <laughs> yeah. I know a few yes. people have been caught doing that mm-hmm. so but I, but like you said the market decides people will find out and then it's not going to look good for you so I you know unless you're in this doing it it's very hard to judge somebody else who's just trying to make a living and make a career out of something they love and it's it's crazy because I think that's everyone's dream to make a job out of doing something creative right and so if someone is doing that in if they're trying to do that in the purest way possible and then there's like an ad every now and then they work it in like don't knock you know we out here living our best creative life did you get any fee uh like bad feedback when you were you when you made the video i was, I was gonna say no but then my wife natalie uh she oh no does she look at the comments she sorted by newest <laughs> oh no natalie yeah and then she's like uh Bullshit, <laughs> total sellout. <laughs> and because like uh, the top comments were all, everybody's just so kind and gen- and nice. Yeah. And like it didn't phase me, but I was also like, but you don't have to, you don't have to read that. <laughs> you know, it doesn't hurt me, but I'm like, what's the point? It, it's not going to make me happier. Yeah. Uh, and but I, I just I knew I made the decision. I I had a strong inclination and idea that people were going to be supportive, and they were. So. Uh, it's awesome, and I, I'm working and, and learning, and this is something that's very new for me. I've only done one sponsorship. I've turned on monetization, but I'm hoping that it's uh, and I it, it's pretty clearly going to work out at this point where I'm going to be able to hire people. I'm going to be able to yeah. have it an editor. It helps you build, and it helps you take the pressure off myself too. Exactly, which is like it gets crazy. But I want to answer. I want to finish that the, the, yeah, the, the tears thing yes, because yes. I, I know we started that. So, so that was the first tier was just, you know, help support my videos. Second tier is get access to my secret podcast. Uh, and then the third tier was get access to exclusive videos. And it was $4, $8, $12. And I based it around, I wanted to do it weekly, but it's that Patreon is only per month. So I wanted to do like $1, $2, $3 per week. And that's how I priced it out. Cause I was like $3 a week is not, that's a cup of coffee every week. That's not a big deal. Uh, and so that's how I priced it. There are people that obviously would be like, that's too expensive or man, like I would give you way more money, <laughs> which you can, if you want, <laughs> not going to say no, but then I do. So I do like a podcast for the podcast. I'll do usually one podcast per month slash it's also extended interviews that I do on the channel. So if I sit down with somebody for 45 minutes and I cut it into a 10 minute video, you can get the extended uh, one that's the easiest piece of content I think to create, and I think that certainly works really well for for what I do. And the extended videos now, or the exclusive videos, uh, I used to do more vlogs and more like at, le- legit, fully produced content. But obviously, that's just it's just too much work. So now I do a lot of behind the scenes content. I do like some more on the fly stuff that's not uh, too labor intensive. But I did recently hire somebody to help me out with the edits. So. Because that's always something, that's what I struggled with, where I got in the zone, because I had a Patreon for like a few months, um, and I thought I was offering a lot of value, but that kind of bit me in the butt, because I was spending so much time on stuff that only 100 people were going to see. And so I I had to kind of do 
you, I kind of had to reevaluate it and um, be like, oh, man, you know, this is a video because I was editing, I was doing live streams. Um, like, this is a video that like my main audience would enjoy. Maybe I just need to like tack a Squarespace ad on it and make this video that I'm posting every week to my YouTube channel, right? right. Um, and I, I think it's it's interesting because different audiences respond to different things. And I think Patreon is such a powerful tool. And I think it works really well for certain people and um, especially podcasts. You know, a lot of great podcasts are making 10K, 15K, 20K a month. And that's basically their main, you know, like uh, listener supported, which is so great. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's just you got to figure out what works for you and don't be afraid to try. You know, I tried it. I learned a lot. And I was like when three people were showing up to my hour long premiere tutorial live stream, I was like, this is not, this is, I could be helping way more people exactly. doing, using this time for something else. Yeah. But I yeah. think that's like smart. It's like a lot of times we get into this idea, this mindset where this is a decision I'm making for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I felt like with advertising. And that's why I framed it as an experiment. Right. And it's funny because Tim Ferriss did the same thing around the same time where he did the reverse where he's like, I'm going to do six months of, only user contribution model. I'm getting rid of all advertising. Wait, when did he do that? Uh, it was Recently? Actually, no. So what happened was he did it. Yeah, he announced it three or four weeks before I did mine. So about a month or two ago. But then he, the feedback was very quick and very swift. And he decided to turn advertising back on. So what did, I haven't listened to his podcast yeah. in a while, but that used to be my, it's funny, that used to be my every week thing, but then he took a break and then I haven't gone back. So, that, so is that scary about like, taking oh breaks? Oh my God, that's, that scares me because I yeah. just took a three month break, four month break yeah. maybe. Um, so what does that mean? What did he shift towards? Because usually his model is he does four minutes of ads in the beginning mm -hmm. and then he just lets the conversation play out. Yeah, so, so what he decided to experiment with was going, having people contribute and he just Did set he it up on Patreon? his no he just set it up on his website and that way it was a i mean in terms of getting i think higher funding it probably helped because it was like one dollar two dollar five dollar and had all these things up to a thousand dollars so you can or maybe even enter whatever and he said he got a bunch of people that contributed a thousand dollars. He did a bit of a breakdown. What he ended up doing though was he's like the feedback was so overwhelming. He didn't say anything about how much money he made through it, but he said that people clearly valued the sponsorships that he was doing and they, they used the products, the shirts that he recommended, the yeah. tea that he recommended. And it's like the $5,000 exercise bikes. Yeah. The Peloton. The Peloton. So it's like those things people have gotten a lot of value from and that's almost part of the show. And he's like, and, and I imagine. And when, when you got that on lock, like that's yeah. good. If you got um, your people used to advertisers. If I guess, I would say that he, he would probably make way more money through advertising as well than through people contributing. I mean, he gets like a million downloads an episode, exactly. right? Like, but he did, he refunded everybody all their money. Oh, wow. So that's really, I think, cool. Because he just yeah. did it for like a week. And he's like, this isn't working. He's like, that was quick. But um, so, yeah, I do agree that like you have to do what feels best for you. Experiment. And that's why I did. I'm like saying this is a six months experiment. But even for me now a couple like a month in i'm like oh this is probably yeah i think this is this is better yeah, yeah. i can uh fall asleep and wake up eight hours later this yeah, is great yeah it really it's really good good i mean i think that's an important note to take is something is not forever especially when you're doing creative stuff like you got to adjust you know the one thing i was gonna say too with uh, patreon is that you have to push it and promote it. And like the, the people That's one thing I didn't do. Yeah, that's why you probably yeah. didn't it didn't grow enough. I for got you. I got like eighty people maybe. Yeah. And I have such a hard time like pushing that that's why like i don't do merch a ton because i'll promote it twice and i'll be like ah okay we're done with that right and that's something you have to do with patreon dude i i pitched patreon in almost every video for like mm -hmm. how long like mm -hmm. eight months or so well, <laughs> and it's a lot and then i feel like i but that's a testament to like you grew a really good audience on that and yeah. you weren't afraid to promote it like, exactly and i think like some of them i'm really proud of i think they're like some of them are pretty funny uh where i i forget one of my favorite ones was I said, you know, for every dollar that's contributed to my Patreon, I will take away a toy from a child who's not in need or something <laughs> like that. 
<laughs> and then I had a, I got my little nephew Oliver, oh and I like pulled a gosh. toy from him, and then he like fell backwards, and he just started crying. That is, so, I was like, you, this is really good. You know what's so funny that. I think your audience is very smart, which is cool, um, because I think the general public uh, wouldn't understand the certain level of sarcasm that you use in your videos, and I really appreciate your your sense of humor, because it's like, it's so dry, and it's so funny. In your, in your recent video, you were like, um, you were talking about, oh, what were you talking about? You're basically like, you could donate to charity, uh, charity or be nice to your wife, or you could just do the opposite. the opposite. And then you just moved on. And I, I was like, oh, that was a joke. <laughs> that was really funny. And you said it in like the same exact tone. And so it's almost like, uh, it's, it's funny. Yeah, it's Nat, different. Nat said that I should have let people know it was a joke. <laughs> She's like, you probably should. Did, did people it wasn't, comment? It was, no, some people, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I saw people comment about that one. I'm sure that they did. But like, she's like, you should have just laughed or something. <laughs> but I was like, I don't know. But that's the whole it joke. Was almost, that. It was almost funnier that way because it literally made me like pause the video and then like go back 10 seconds and be like, like oh my real? God. <laughs> well, the joke came from this idea that like I, when I was just kind of writing out my ideas for it, I was like thinking this whole experiment that I did was doing too much in 30 days, which it was like building three habits over 30 days yeah. when I would typically recommend just build one thing at a time, keep right. it slow and steady. Right. And I'm like, yeah, but every once in a while we do have to like do the opposite of what we're told. And I'm like, but that doesn't, that does, that's not a rule that should be applied everywhere because it's, it's clearly debunked very quickly. <laughs> and I was like, let me just act, uh, look like an idiot. But, oh um, God, that so funny. yeah, that worked out well. I mean, I don't know. What are we talking about? <laughs> what are you even talking about? I want to use the few last 10 to 15 minutes to be selfish as a, um, it, you know, I don't think I can, can I call myself a documentary person? Yeah. I don't know. I make, I've never made a full documentary, but I've done a, done a lot of like docu-series stuff. And so it's always in the back of my head where I'm like, I feel like I have to at least once in my life make a feature documentary, you know? Um, cause it's like, that's the level of that. That's the storytelling I like. I hate scripted stuff. I will never do anything scripted. Um, you know, I'll have fun in my own YouTube videos being goofy and, you know, little acting here and there, but never do scripted stuff. Um, and so that's always in the back of my head and I'm like, oh my gosh, I could ask Matt some questions. And I think the, the biggest thing is distribution and has your, have your opinions changed since releasing minimalism based on what the platforms have been doing? Cause you got into Netflix really when, I mean, I'm sure it was cool to be on Netflix, but now Netflix is the hot thing. You don't want to have it on uh, I can't even come up with another Vimeo, Hulu. I, yeah. Hulu's cool too. Hulu's cool. I don't know. But Amazon it's, Prime. Amazon Prime. You There's think good of, stuff on all these. You platforms. think of Netflix though. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> Sorry, Netflix. Are you <laughs> under contract? <laughs> I gotta look at my contract. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, I'll make up. Net Netflix is the one I think of, and I think yeah. what a lot of people think of. Um, and so because of that, it is now harder to, I think, distribute to Netflix. But what was your process getting minimalism to it? Did it start as something where, oh, they're going to host it, but they're not going to promote it. And then you got some organic traction. And now when you, when you literally go to the documentary section, you're like on the first page. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 I always think of you. I'm That's like, so cool. shout out, shout out to Matt. Yeah. It's all, there's an algorithm. So maybe it's cause you've seen it before or gotcha. you know what I mean? Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But actually, I think it did recently trend again. Somebody said, yeah? somebody messaged me yeah, yeah. saying that it did. But so, I mean, what was that process when you, was that f three years ago, four years ago? When did it first come 2016 out? 2016 is when it came okay. out, uh, December 2016. So, I think the advice that nobody likes to hear, which is the truth, is that you just need to make a really great documentary first. Like, you have to make something that's amazing that they couldn't say no to. And we made something that they said no to. <laughs> so they actually did say no to us at first. And then we had to, uh, what, what happened was we like reached out. We, after we made the film, the film was done, it was complete. And then 
I think we had reached out and, and couldn't get connected. We couldn't find anybody that would be willing to watch the documentary. And then we re- released it independently. And then it did really well. It got to the top chart on iTunes. Like, thanks to Josh and Ryan's audience that were really into minimalism. I think that helped to create a tipping point where enough people went to watch it. And then I think we reached out to Netflix after that and they were like, it doesn't fit our cadence and the flow of the documentaries that we like to have on Netflix. And then we found another third party partner who like was connected with Netflix that was just somehow, whether it's a different contact, I don't really know what happened, but they ended up being able to, to get us. I don't know if it's because it started to do well on iTunes and all these other platforms, but whatever it was, there was some puppet mastery going on behind the scenes that somebody was able to get us in uh, on the platform. And then we released it to Netflix December, 2016. And then it w- went trending on the homepage for a, a week or two, whatever month. I don't know how long it was. And then it did so well that they decided to pick it up for an international release. So they do distribution for domestic. And then that's just like all English speaking countries usually. So, and then after that it would be subtitled to all these different languages and released throughout the world. Uh, so that, I mean, obviously uh, the whole experience was super surreal and awesome. And, but it started with making a documentary that we thought was really great and just put everything we had into it. And I think if somebody is, doesn't have any relationships or connections with Netflix, that's how you start and you make a really good trailer for it to get somebody interested because somebody's not going to watch a full film before they watch a short trailer. That's a good point. Yeah. And it's like, but also I wouldn't worry about Netflix too because there are other platforms that you could get it on uh you're looking for i think in the beginning money is less important than exposure i think money is important for us it was let's make our money back right because i put like 15 grand of my own money josh and ryan probably put 50 or 60k plus into it and so we're like oh god if we just make this money back that would just be amazing and then after that it's like oh my god we made profit awesome we can do this again and then once we already had that connection, then you're kind of in the door and then there's more opportunity. And it's almost like that first one is the most important just to get those connections, like you said, and make a name for yourself. And uh, I mean, it's so it's very valuable to then also put that on your long list of credentials for them when you're building the next thing. Say it's a YouTube channel or another documentary. You have that to tack on your list and it's just, it snowballs from there. You know, yeah, I think that you have to. I mean, you just have to make amazing work mm-hmm. and just put yourself into it completely and try to let go of the any expectation of where it's going to go. And do you think how much value is there on exclusive releases, though? Do you think if it's kind of like do it yourself vibe, you know, you can produce it on your own? Do you think it's more likely to self release, get the buzz and then get someone to pick it up just for that? Oh, like, okay, you already released it, but we want to license it, you know, for that exposure play. That's a good question. And I don't know. I think, I wonder if we are an outlier in that our film was released to iTunes and these, it, it actually wasn't released to any other streaming services. Obviously it wasn't released to Hulu or Amazon prime. Um, but it wasn't exclusive just to Netflix because you could buy it independently on iTunes. Mm-hmm. But with if it's a Netflix original, you can't mm-hmm. purchase it one off anywhere else. Right. You can only get it on Netflix. And I mean, that's, I think... That gen- might just be another... It's, like, it's something to consider. It's like, yeah. and like, I think that you should consider that before you go the distribution route and before you decide, hey, I want to release this on my own, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just put it up on Vimeo and see how well it does mm-hmm. because that might hurt the chances of right. Netflix picking it up later. Right. Netflix might, if you also have a connection, I think down the road, once you've maybe established yourself and you've got a documentary under your belt, or if you are collaborating with somebody, if you are a documentary filmmaker working with somebody who's got a very large audience, that audience has a lot of clout that Netflix would be interested in and you could go in and pitch it and then they could potentially fund the documentary project right. that you're making. Right. So there's definitely a couple different ways to go about it, mm-hmm. but, and I'll let you know if and when this next project hmm. works Are out. you allowed to tease anything? I don't know. I gotta, I do, <laughs> cause I don't do any of the contracts and like the behind the scenes right, stuff, right, right. which is actually like one of those 
lessons where it's like, I can just focus on the filmmaking. Right. And I don't have to worry about the deals and right. the PowerPoint. Do you have slides. a manager now? Uh, so I've been working with Space Station uh, oh, yeah, yeah. to help me Good with people. just like the sponsorships and stuff. And they've been amazing. And but apart from that, I don't have like a manager. Yeah. Is that on your list of people? Probably. To, Is it good? Yeah. Do you like having a manager? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it helps you. Um, I mean, I would love a, maybe in the perfect world, you find someone who isn't as established and doesn't have a ton of clients where you could have like the combo of them just checking your inbox too. Um, I was going to go for Scooter Braun. Can I? Yes. Is that not good? You know, I heard he's Taylor going through something right now. <laughs> yeah. I don't think Drama. you would want to put yourself uh, against Taylor Swift, but Wouldn't maybe to. something to consider. Can't we all be friends? Because <laughs> <laughs> my biggest problem is email. So my mm -hmm. manager just does like uh, inbound stuff. So he'll uh, manage the deals and contracts and fees because you don't want to talk about you don't want to be vouching for your own value it always comes off better coming from another person you basically can't, yeah so, yeah i think space station might yeah. be able to help me with that but yeah. it's like just the yeah you don't want to be talking about money uh mm -hmm. and, and like negotiating your own rates because yeah. i just don't want to do that anymore for anything it's like even if i'm hiring worst. a filmmaker for a day yeah. i don't want to be like what's your rate could you actually do this instead yeah <laughs> and exactly. like i just feel bad honestly okay i I, this is a terrible thing to end on, but because um, <laughs> it's like, you know, I'm so raw, raw for the creative community. That could be a segment. And getting, yeah, I know, right? Like, and now to end on something horrible. <laughs> exactly. Because I'm all for get the money creatives. Heck yeah. But every time I reach out to a professional, not even a perfect, like a mid-tier cinematographer to maybe help me on a special product, it seems like their day rates always start at like $1,000, $1,500. And I'm like... I start to wonder if I'm in the wrong career path. You know, I'm like, how is this? Maybe it's the fact that maybe they see me having money or I don't know. Yeah, maybe, I, I, yeah, don't, yeah. I don't have $1,500 <laughs> a day to just like yeah. throw at a cinematar. I don't know. Maybe it's the camera. I've seen that too, though. It's funny because I, I, we were texting before this about uh, trying to get advice for a filmmaker in the area. And then I did reach out to some people. And I was surprised. Like, I got a bunch of people that their day rate was $1,000. And, like, and their kit was, like, a Sony A7R2 or something. And I'm, like, I would ex at least expect to see 200 or 300 for a $1,000 day rate. And then I'll get expensive. that. And then they'll also say, oh, and I have to rent out my gear. Right, on top of that. On yeah. top of that. And I'm, like, it. I don't know. It may I be, think, guys. The game, I has think the game changed? I mean, if people are doing well, that's amazing. <sighs> yes. But also, like, I... I I mean, maybe it's New York, but I, I don't know. Still, guys, all I'm saying is I think there is a really good niche out there for you to own some like solid mid tier gear. You don't have to have a red and to have a day rate from like three to five hundred dollars and you make good shit like you could kill with that. Yeah, I think don't don't scare people <laughs> away, too, with like the I mean, unless if you're doing really well and you could just be like, that's my rate. Sorry. Then, then yeah. And I would do that, too. To like, yeah. I mean, honestly, because I wouldn't do day rate cinematography like later on in my career because like I, I had done that early on. And like, I mean, my day rate fluctuated from four hundred dollars to if I was really doing well, it was up to twelve hundred. But like for the most part, it was pretty low, especially early on in my career when I didn't have like a kit or experience or any of that stuff. But then sometimes you get an email in and you're like, oh, I know this person can't afford me. So I would just say, oh, my budgets start at around X, whether it's 5,000 or 10,000, whatever. Uh, but also I, that was, that's, those numbers are like me producing, docu like directing, well, doing the whole yeah. deal. Yeah. And it's, it's so different. Cause I think too, when you're talking to YouTubers, um, you know, whenever, if it's brand work or whatever, uh, brands are getting the production, the talent and the distribution. Right. So we're very used to, okay, you're getting a great deal. Cause I do everything. And then that's why it's so hard for me when I'm reaching out to, uh, talent to help. It's kind of like, well, I'll just do that by myself. But at the same time, if you are getting those rates from companies, good for you just keep going yeah, I, yeah. It, keep it's one of those things where it just shocked me i was like well if this all goes badly i can i can go be a cinematographer yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, man, there's like, good money in it uh, yeah i'm like i'm glad <laughs> like, i wish i was making this money i'm glad that's the thing good for you guys yeah there's uh there's but uh, to that to that same point there there was one guy at least one guy recently who's like i will fly from north carolina 
to help you for free on this shoot. And I'm like, I want it to be like, yes, but also I just feel, I'm like, dude, it's not worth it for you. It's three hours. (laughs) And like, (laughs) you also don't want to be the person that then gets, uh, this is going to sound so again, like you don't trust people, but also I feel like those things could turn into, Oh, if they don't, get what they're expecting then they can turn around and be like famous youtuber matt diavella uh used me for free how dare he you know and it's like well you want to pay people but yeah i I probably i wouldn't do that either i would i would just not like if even if i'm having an assistant come out and help i'd at least give him a hundred bucks for a couple hours like or, or the day or whatever just like help out uh like i've never i mean i know that people are willing to do work for free and i myself was young and willing to work for free or for really cheap um but i just always feel like i'm i feel guilty (laughs) yeah well it's it's context you know it's like for sure if it's your siblings who's getting into film and they want to film your wedding for free and you know you don't care if they mess it up you know it's it's like okay it's awesome that people are doing so well (laughs) yeah should Great. We, we should change. We just change we our should. career path. Exactly. Thousand dollars a day. Honestly, that's what every time I reach out to these people, that's what I'm thinking. Um, it sucks because it's that's why what makes it so. I mean, again, we're 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 I, I don't know. Maybe we're we shouldn't be saying this. <laughs> But I'm just saying, like, I mean, that's it's tough to hire out people. This is why videos are expensive. This is why you have to yeah. do sponsorships and advertising. Yeah. Because, like, I really want to make amazing videos, and I want to hire really great people, the mm-hmm. best people. Yeah. But if people that are not great are <laughs> charging a thousand dollars, exactly. What are like the, the the great DPs yeah. cost? Yeah. I know. The big kit I know. and all this stuff. So it's like you know, video and filmmaking is very expensive, and uh, I, I really do think we should continually up our budgets. But that's why I think. Maybe that's where a, a retainer comes in handy, where you hire somebody for a couple thousand bucks for the month, and then it's four days, and then you get a good rate where you're paying them five hundred dollars a day. Yeah. Uh, and because then, I mean, dude, retainers for me early on as a freelancer helped me survive. That was I had a retainer for maybe five years with a client, wow. and they just paid me every single month, and I did lots and lots of work with them. It was guaranteed work, guaranteed money every month. And I know lots and lots of filmmakers would much rather have that kind of consistency of being like, hey, I'm going to make $2,000 every month versus $1,000 a couple there. times a year. Because I guess that's why they charge so much is like yeah. that could be one of only two jobs they do the entire month, yeah, right? Exactly. But I'm like, well, that's not my problem. But um, <laughs> <laughs> again, <laughs> uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's actually really good general advice to uh, whenever you're working with brands, see how to make it more long term. Like, hey, well, do you need a filmmaker? Is this going to be a consistent thing? Because, you know, it's, I never thought of the retainer thing. Yeah, and, and, I, th- and I think, yeah, also if you're going to give a budget have a conversation first or at least understand what they need so then you can provide a couple different options i mean because like a lot of people are like well this is the way people do it they have day rates that's the way it goes but you could also say you know this is my half day rate this is my day rate here's different packages that you could purchase from me and it makes it easier for the person who's hiring you to have options and have confidence that they're going to get what they need yeah that's good. That's good. Okay. Maybe we can end on a, maybe a little bit more positive. Do you have any advice for the people at home who want to live their best creative life, Matt? What have you learned throughout your journey of being a documentary filmmaker and now a YouTuber, someone who is constantly trying to better themselves? You have a lot of good self-help out there. Um, so this is a very broad question for someone who always makes videos about this. But anything stands out maybe for my audience? I just... I'm working on a video right now and it's like about the things that you shouldn't let ruin your life. And it sounds like, it sounds like a sad video. (laughs) It sounds depressing, (laughs) but it's, it's, it's something that I'm working on myself and it's one, don't set unrealistic expectations. Don't say, Oh, I need to get this amount of views or I need this amount of money. Like it's these if then statements like then I'll be happy. Uh, do not set expectations. Don't use metrics as uh, a way to measure how well you're doing. It's so easy to do because numbers are right there on a screen. We can compare ourselves to our friends, our family, and everybody else in our social circle. Or we can do something a little bit more difficult, which is like try to measure how happy we are, how content we are, how challenged we are, uh, whether that's through a journaling practice or another way to track um, how your well-being is progressing. 
those are the things we, we should be focusing on. Like I can't compete with you on salary, but I'm going to try to compete with you on happiness. And I want to try to make everybody around me and my family and friends as happy as possible. So I focus on those things and also don't be a perfectionist. And that's something that I continually struggle with. And even on this trip, you know, when I leave, I'm looking at all my gear. I'm like, okay, I should bring the C200. I should bring four lenses. I should bring the gimbal and the drone and the tripods and, you know, all these different mounts and lights. And I'm like, what the heck? Like, I'm just going on a little vacation. I can shoot with much less. So I put a constraint on myself to prevent myself from being a perfectionist. And I just brought a very, you know, simple vlogging kit, the A7R2 with a mic and a jobby stand and like batteries and that's it. And I was like, all right, normally I, I shoot and edit my videos with much more, but let me just try on this video to create a false constraint. And I think you can do that in other ways where if maybe you're like really um, you obsessed with cleaning your part and making it really tidy, then you might want to restrict the amount of time that you spend doing that. Be like, okay, I'm going to set a timer for 30 minutes and that's all the time I have to clean my... Maybe throw apartment. a t-shirt on the floor. Live Maybe, a little. <laughs> yeah, live a little. Get you a know? little bit crazy. Get a little bit crazy. But yeah, perfectionism is like a virus and it's something that <laughs> I am working to get out of my body. <laughs> yeah, it, it's probably... Uh, on the list of the better viruses to have in life. Sure. Though. There's yeah. positives to it because it pushes you to do your best and you will and should cross the line of putting too much effort into a project or a video because I think most people just aren't spending enough time on their work uh, to make it great. But when you are just a chronic perfectionist and it is it consumes your life even when you've made an amazing video, uh, then I think it's time to step back. Definitely, yeah. You know what they say? Happiness is equal to expectations minus reality. Wow. So put it on a postcard. Boom. Put it on a postcard. Make and, a shirt. And put it on your fridge. <laughs> put it on your fridge, Matt. Thank you so much for being on That Creative Life. Guys, make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm there waiting for you every Monday. Yes, that's right. I'm trying to be consistent after a very long break. We're going to try to have these stints of consistencies every single Monday and then I might disappear again for another three to four months. Yeah. But while it's going, people need to know every Monday. Come every on. Every Monday. Every Monday. Until I disappear again. Yeah. This was but so much fun. Monday. It was so good to catch up with you I know, again. I know. We were just talking about how it's a fun way to catch up with cool creative friends. Is sitting down chatting and then, you know, you guys can just be a fly in the wall to the conversation. So it was really good catching up. Um follow is your podcast uh, still going? It's still going. Kind of. Still going. No, I'm taking a little break. I'm, yeah, at, yeah. I'm like three or four weeks off at yeah. now, um, and I'll probably get Better back than to it me soon. Though. Yeah, I mean, yeah. guys, he has so much amazing stuff to follow. Check out his YouTube channel, podcast, Patreon, all the things, the Instagram. All the links will be in the description below. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Okay, let's have 10 seconds of just this air so I can... Uh, this is me breathing. <sighs> yeah, so I can hopefully cut in post. Yeah. Okay. You know what's my life now? It's just like cutting up cardboard boxes. It's, yeah. It's so and you know what's fun? It never ends. It never you ends. you like, think okay, it will end, but it will never end. Yeah.